we will be joined by Damien Vauxhall from 11th Hour Ocean Racing. So if you are not familiar with Damien, he's a, a heavyweight in the sailing world. He has um, logged over 450,000 nautical miles. He's done plus um, 20 transatlantic crossings. Um, he has done six Volvo Ocean races and he has uh, a lot of um, world records uh, under his belt. Hi, Damien. I think we're good. Looks like I'm in. You're in. Oh, yeah. The hard part's over. That's right. <laughs> it's always right. It's always the difficult bit getting all the tech to work. How are you? Very good. Yeah, no, I'm very happy to be here and to chat on the, I really like it, the must know series. Thank you. Thanks. We're, we're pretty proud of that. We're pretty proud of that name. <laughs> Um, we're, we're really happy to have you. Um, I don't know if you heard, I was just doing a quick intro to anyone um, who might not know you. Um, I think you're you're pretty famous in the sailing world with everything you've achieved. Um, am I right in saying it's uh, 20 transatlantic crossings, 10 round the worlds, and six Volvo Ocean races? Just to name a few. Who's counting? Who's counting? Who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> Am I famous or I'd prefer maybe to be infamous? Want, well, we can go with infamous. That's I'm saying no bother. In, the infamous Damien Boxel has joined us. <laughs> um, well, we're really happy to have you here. And obviously, um, the kind of purpose of this evening's call is to talk um, all things sustainability as you've moved uh, from, I guess, a, into a different role um, from sail racing to um, the sustainability program manager for 11th hour. So... Um, we're here to have you tell everything we must know about sustainability. Um, but to kick off, uh, you do have some amazing sailing experience and I wonder if you could just share a little bit about um, your career, give us a bit more background into your racing career, your sailing, how you got into that. Yeah, thanks. No, it's, I, think we're, um, I think we're all very lucky, honestly, to be involved in, the, um, in marine sports and and sailing in our sector so it's it's such it's a sport which is so diverse and yeah. gives us so many opportunities in terms of um you know professional scope or uh, you know recreation and leisure i grew up on the southwest coast of ireland in the county in the county of kerry oh not your fault we call it the kingdom <laughs> <laughs> we call it the kingdom um and um to be honest, it was pretty far away from formal sailing and some formal, formally structured sailing. And I think, to be honest, that probably worked to my benefit. Mm. Um, we're very much about um, exploring and adventure and discovering, I, I guess, kind of using the history of sailing. Uh, you know, looking at the history of sailing is very much about exploratory um, and discovering the bays and discovering yeah. the islands offshore. The fun uh, of it. We did a lot of fishing. <laughs> The fun of it, yeah, totally. Um, and subsequently, of course, you know, having made a career in sailing and made a career in in ocean racing, it's um, I guess you know, in hindsight, I was probably in the right place at the right time. The sport yeah. of sailing um, transformed into a profession at a time where I was just in the right place at the right time. And uh, but I don't think you know, I I really believe that the the starting point for me in growing up in southwest um southwest Kerry was is very inherent to the success that i've had and to probably where i am now uh, yeah. we were embedded in nature and surrounded by nature and i think it's something that we all appreciate as as you know being sailors and being on the water um, it's something that's quite unique in what we do because many other sports are in a st stadium or an arena, kind of a controlled environment. Yeah. Whereas we're very much embedded in, um, in, in nature and in using and harnessing, um, you know, the power of nature to mm -hmm. achieve a performance. Yeah. And we don't control that. It's very much about, again, trying to harness, uh, harness the power and to establish a strategy and a performance within a, yeah. within the environment yeah and yeah. i think what we've realized 
as a sport and as athletes and as teams is that we it also provides us with an amazing opportunity to share that with a wider audience right. and that's where we're at today yeah i it's mean you literally really see places that no one else on earth might ever see um and you experience mother nature in a way that we you know you just don't when you're when you're on land um and uh you're you're out there in the middle of the ocean kind of at her at her will um so it's it's a, a phenomenal kind of career to build and experience to get you've obviously had this kind of plethora of different sailing experiences are there any that stand out is it you know from those days in Kerry or is it you know from the Volvo Ocean Race like what what memories kind of stand out to you yeah, thanks. I mean, I guess um, there's a lot of stories out there and it's not, of course, always about the uh, most obvious. But the really key moments are times when you're in the deep down. You know, I think the first ocean race I did um, was at the time it was, I think it was the Volvo Ocean Race. It just become the Volvo Ocean Race, um, previously the Whitbread. And there was no ice skate, so we got pretty far ourselves. We started to see icebergs and sail through icebergs. Um, very well into the realm of the albatross <clears throat> and I think you know they're the moments that that stay with us yeah um, yeah first ocean race with Tycho for me and and subsequently we've actually you know finished a couple of races into Ireland um, into Galway um, nice. in fact the ocean race that we won was finished at the last stop over in Galway so um no. I guess a kind of a, a dream forged in gold in some ways. Yeah, um, there's some and, part of you know, it's, it, Yeah, I mean, it was very much, I guess, about, you know, take, you know, taking the realization of what we're doing on the water and trying to build out something more important and meaningful in terms of where we are today. And I think as a sport, uh, not only as athletes and teams, but, you know, when we look at what World Sailing is doing with their Agenda 2030, when we look at what our team is doing today and, you know, um, manufacturers like Musto, for instance, are doing in, um, on that side, there's, there's a real push to redefining what our sport means. Yeah. And it's been, you know, it's amazing to see that shift. Yeah. And it's just the start. It's really exciting. And, I really feel that we are going to make a huge difference. The sailing community has a lot to offer yeah. um, the world as a whole and our ability to innovate and our recognition of what we're doing within the natural world is, yeah. is probably something that really has a lot of value to bring to uh, the bigger story. Absolutely. And I just, I think that it's so obvious that um, to me, anyway, that your passion for sailing is, almost very naturally paved the way into what you're doing now just having that affinity to the ocean and to the environment and um you know having that real love for it um I don't know if you could touch a bit more about the move from I guess when you were uh, racing and then I'm moving into the more sustainability sector and focusing on that element of things yeah it's funny you never know how how your career path is going to go and yeah. growing up I certainly um, you know, I thought about marine biology mm -hmm. and we were making our own surfboards and going surfing in the midwinter. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, very lucky to have forged a career almost 30 years or more now in professional sailing. Mm -hmm. um, there was an, it was a natural progression, which wasn't something that I especially, I guess, sort of looked for, but it was very natural. I spent uh, at least four years working with the Oman Sail Program, which was exploring and developing other ways of looking at sailing and driving benefit to the key stakeholders. A large part of that was community outreach and supporting youth development, um, promoting Oman as a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, I spent six years working with the, edu with the Canadian Wildlife Federation as their education manager and re connecting communities with the outdoors, mm -hmm. which was, I guess, very much the space we just talked about. Um, and at the same time, I was, you know, still sailing competitively. And that gave me the platform, I guess, to um, meet Mark and Charlie uh, for the first time as they were putting together the Vestas 11th Hour Racing Project. I, um, we first started talking about sailing and the, in being involved with them as a sailor, but I have a sneaky suspicion that they were well aware of the work I was doing in the background and the okay. importance that sustainability was going to have in the campaign. Um, so I got to sail a leg 
And then I also got to transfer, uh, you know, into very much into the sustainability space. And we had 12 months to apply sustainability to the Festus 11th Hour Racing Campaign and to do it in a comprehensive way, embedding it through what we saw were the key challenges, risks, and opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, we engaged with Musto, if you guys remember, yeah. and, and uh, you know, some very simple questions. Well, you know, definitely want to use the gear. Uh, what can we do about the, um, you know, about packaging and and um, and and the sort of footprints that's associated with that? And we came up. I think you know, you guys yeah. came up with a, a very neat yeah. um, first solution, yeah. which was Good. which was around the packaging, and that was just from a very simple call. So yeah, and that shows the power of collaboration as well, right? Like, and, you know, um, we do all have this shared passion for the outdoors, and you know, we're always talking musto about our sports, like they can't exist without the environments that they happen in, whether that's on the ocean or in the field. And so we are, we are intrinsically tied to, to nature in that way. So we care very deeply about it. Um, and then we learn so much from partnerships, like 11th Hour, where you're doing all this research and education and you're kind of, you know, you're experiencing the ocean um, firsthand and seeing the changes too. Um, and, you know, we're really proud. We've made some small steps to the packaging for sure. We're 100% recyclable at the moment. Um, and it's not, uh, we're not perfect by any means, but uh, hopefully with the likes of you. And as you said, there's just a really great opportunity there within sailing to to change how things are done and, and, um, and build some really robust sustainability strategies that have longevity, I guess, as well. But... Yeah, I think that was, you know, that was one of the standout, I guess, wins for, for us and hopefully for Musto and, you know, as a way of collaborating, looking at sustainable sourcing, looking at our partnerships, looking at the value of what we're doing mm -hmm. and the, not just the economic spend with a key supplier and partner, but um, looking beyond that in terms of how can we leverage that interaction to drive uh, more benefit yeah. you know economically socially environmentally mm. and it's very obvious and quite easy in the in the single use plastic space because honestly it's a fairly easy subject to tackle but um what we need to do now is look at the broader landscape of sustainability and and um and some of the bigger issues with regards to how do we get these boats on the water and what components materials and manufacturing processes yeah. are we um are we applying yeah. um, and how can we improve it? And it's interesting, like when we, it was a very natural conversation with Musto, um, but, you know, as we take that approach that we've, I guess, you know, created with you guys and have applied it to this new campaign, the 11th hour racing team entering the ocean mm -hmm. race um, for a three or four year campaign where, you know, there's a, we, there's a, the scope of the campaign is huge. Yeah. The, the list of suppliers is really long. And we're trying to reach out to, we're basically kind of mapping, if you like, um, the, and trying to prioritize the key stakeholders that we need to start with. How are we getting boats? How are we getting a boat on the water? What sails are we mm -hmm. using? What components um, are, make that up? Yeah. And asking those similar questions. And so, you know, luckily with, with Musto and taking that as a starting point, we are now at a new level of, of conversation with you guys as well, right? So there's the uh, Mono Material yeah. Initiative, um, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of how we can um, integrate end of life into the product at the design phase. Yeah. So that's something that's really exciting. It's really exciting. I think it's something as well, you know, our product team in particular, they love a challenge. They are innovation led and you know, sustainability it does pose this kind of question of how how you continue to build the same product that is really durable um does its job but is also sustainable and sustainable resource or what um it's those two aren't mutually exclusive and i think the product team have done some amazing work in the research and development phases of that and um we're definitely looking forward to kind of releasing those and uh, kind of talking a bit more about the tech because it's it's really cool stuff like it's it's I'm blown away by it every time I kind of read a bit a bit about whether it's mono mono fabrics um whether it's something our partners are doing like uh, Primaloft for example are using recycled bottles to do their Primaloft insulation um there's just a lot of really innovative out-of-the-box thinking going on um and so it's 
it's quite a fun uh, part, thing to be a part of and to see happening and evolving. Um, it, it's obviously a huge project though. Like how do you come, when you, sustainability is such a big topic. Wh how do you make steps? How do you kind of see the wood for the trees within that? I think that's a really good question. And, um, and you know, as I sit here, actually, I'm kind of looking out at a landscape of wooden trees. <laughs> and, and I guess this really prompts the kind of the vision of um, the landscape of sustainability and, mm -hmm. and single use plastics has been a, is a very common topic, which has, you know, captured everyone's mm -hmm. imagination. There's been a real drive behind it. It's the solutions are, are out there they're happening. Um, and I think just taking those simple first steps is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, but then as we achieve some simple successes and revise kind of, you know, review what we've done, look at the successes, looking at the maybe the missed opportunities to start the cycle again. Um, we also need to take the opportunity to put up the, send up the drone and take a thousand, mm -hmm. 10,000 foot view on, on the overall landscape and start to consider Again, you know, what is our full scope of opportunity and responsibility? So, um, you know, many teams now, most sailing teams and, this, and most sports are really looking at this space, mm. but um, only a few of them are really considering the full breadth of our responsibility. And mm. it's, it's um, you know, there's the economic aspect and looking at supporting sustainable industries, uh, making sure that our dollar spend or um, you know, this conscious, conscious consumerism in terms of how we, um, where we spend our dollar. Mm -hmm. If I spend my dollar with Musno, it's because I like the product. I like how it's being made. I like who made it. Mm -hmm. I like the material it's made in, the way it's packaged, the way it's delivered, and the fact that there's an end of life plan for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to take that approach with everything we do. We also then need to consider uh, in terms of, there are still many um, Undirect and um, unavoidable, unavo uh, unavoidable footprints that we need to take into into consideration. And so, in our drive towards being plan climate positive, it's not just about compensating for our unavoidable footprint. It's also about considering how, through our campaign, we can actually leave the world a better a better place by our participation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so, if we're just if we're sequestering carbon to compensate for our footprint, hopefully. We want to go beyond that and make sure that that single action actually um, has a positive, yeah. um, a positive footprint. Yeah, that's a really important point you make about kind of behaviours and um, I guess moving away slightly from what brands are doing and what, um, what companies or teams are doing, it's that personal behavioural change and, you know, because uh, sustainability can seem overwhelming. Um, some people and it's uh, I don't know if you've uh, any kind of tips on things that people can start to do or ways that you can kind of dip your toe in the water or the importance of just making small changes I guess I think it's the starting point is just uh, defining who you are and what you're doing mm -hmm. um is it mum and dad driving kids around the lake or is it a ocean race team and America's cup team? Is it an organization or a company that's, uh, that's producing something? Are you a producer, a consumer or both? Typically at home, of course, we're consumers. Yeah. And so that's, you know, we just talked about the value of, of um, being conscious and mindful in that process. And, um, you know, when you spend it, just um, you're voting. Basically, when you pull it, your wallet out, you're voting. You say, I agree with mm -hmm. where this came from and how it's provided. So that's the starting point. Yeah. Um, and then typically at work, we're producers, right? So uh, we may also be consumers at work, um, bringing in materials to the factory or whatever we're producing. Mm -hmm. But um, at work, we're producing. I think this is, we spend a lot of our time at work. We, this is where we typically, um, even on the shop floor, have a real um, potential to influence our, our peers, our colleagues, the company we're working for, and the whole value chain, you know, utilities and materials coming into our company and the way it's and the way the pro end products are going out whether they're virtual services or real tangible products so yeah. um i think we need to consider ourselves um on both sides of that uh, consumer and producer um counter and make sure that through everything that we do we we um we do it in a mindful way yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Mindful, mindful is such a key word for that, isn't it? Just stopping and thinking that little bit more. Um, and you mentioned plastics and obviously plastics has been a huge, um, kind of topic that's been discussed in mainstream media at the mo- at the moment of the last few years. Um, what what uh, is, for anyone who doesn't know, it's pretty always plastic for you, July, and uh, how can you get involved in that? I think plastic, I, would, I, I saw an amazing lady last year and um, her and her family, I can't remember her name, but you may remember, um, her and her family basically live um, a plastic-free life and they, they are plastic footprint can be held within a single glass jar for the year. Um, so that's a kind of an extreme version. Yeah. And I think we can all aspire to watch yeah. that even for just the month of July would be a challenge mm-hmm. because as we sit here, as I sit here, I'm holding plastic, I'm sitting yeah. on plastic. In some cases I'm wearing plastic. Mm-hmm. And so the challenge of kind of trying to free ourselves up from the unnecessary plastic is, is yeah. the challenge. And, um, you know, I mean, again, I think it just starts with those simple first steps and, and accepting that maybe there's a little bit of e- extra effort and time needed. Yeah. So when we go to the supermarket, um, you know, if you don't have time, it's always going to be the easy, quick and, un- and typically unsustainable option. Right. Whereas if you have a little bit of extra time embedded in and you enjoy the journey and you enjoy, and in this case, enjoy going to the supermarket, yeah. spend an extra few minutes and going through the fresh produce and looking for the ones that are not wrapped in plastic. Yeah. Uh, we're always looking for the quick, simple and yeah. um, I guess quick solutions, but um, it's, you know, I think time, the time factor is the one where if we don't take the time, then we're not really going to manage to yeah. achieve a sustainable yeah. future. It is funny because when you start to think about plastic, you do sort of realize how surrounded you are by it and you go and you go into the supermarket and you're picking up an avocado or whatever it is. And it's, in its own plastic container and you just so even I guess just back to the mindfulness thing is thinking a bit more about you know is there um is there a bunch of tomatoes there that aren't in a plastic plastic box um and making those small habitual changes so um um trying to I think trying to um I'm currently here in Canada and yeah um in Quebec actually there's um glass is not recycled they don't oh, have right. a mechanism for that, which it seems amazing yeah. um, because, of course, in Europe and Ireland, and it is. Um, but again, you know, there is a movement um, specifically to return the responsibility for some of this packaging and some of these footprints to the producer. And so, mm. um, you know, there's one organization that, you know, suggests that when you finish your beer or your, your bottle of Coke, mm. you take it back to the store and you leave it on the doorstep. Right. Um, or at least you kind of do it in a way which hopefully promotes um, mm-hmm. some sort of transfer of responsibility back yeah. to the producer. And yeah. I mean, that needs to be done in the right way because, um, you know, negative approach can you know, typically doesn't drive the right results. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, for instance, our team working with Musto, we've asked some of the questions you guys have asked just as many questions as we have. And we've come with, up with a full range of solutions this time. We've talked about monomaterial. We've talked about end of life where there's, um, I believe a kind of a, a move towards looking at um, at uh, repair shops or services um, in the in the future. Maybe that's a little further away. Um, we're all, we've also talked about exploring the supply chain in terms of the products that uh, we're sourcing with you guys to understand further down the supply chain where they're coming from, yeah. whether it's uh, whether it's the raw materials or so. So. Yeah. And that's really exciting. And to be able to have those conversations with suppliers is. Yeah. is key. And when, you know, it's obviously this is a long term journey. It's something that um, you're building to and adding to and it's evolving as technology evolves, as you kind of uncover more and more and more and more, do- more doors open. Um, what how are you kind of measuring success throughout this? What are, are there some kind of key milestones that you're hitting that you're checking off or? Yeah, clearly. Um, I think in, uh, before we get there, probably, you know, in, when we're looking at the full landscape of sustainability and what our goals should be and what our targets should mm-hmm. be, um, we're also looking for benchmarks in terms of what's uh, already out there and, and also the risks and challenges, the, uh, the barriers to trying to achieve, you know, to achieving some of those goals. Typically, time, yeah. um, especially when we're trying to um, transform manufacturing as an example is one of the key challenges right. so you know where uh, 
when you're six months out from, a, from the start of a race, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to transform manufacturing at multiple levels mm -hmm. within your supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, we're lucky as a team because this time we're on the third cycle of, a, of a Mark and Charlie's ocean race uh, saga uh, with the 11th hour racing team. Uh, we've got more time to prepare, the, uh, prepare for the race, to engage our suppliers and to you know, see where we can make some of these transformations. And so I think that goes along with um, setting those ambitious but realistic targets. It's okay to fail. Yeah. Um, what's probably not okay is to you know, set your targets too low and, um, and to not ask those hard questions right. because you're afraid that you won't, you know, they're unrealistic. Honestly, yeah. everyone we speak to, must of course included, <laughs> but, you know, beyond that, everyone's um, been happy to, uh, to explore these questions yeah. with us. And, and uh, in many cases, we've found hidden gems. You know, mm. um, employees have realized, well, actually, our company did have a sustainability program. I didn't know it existed. Yeah. Yeah. We're compensating for our carbon footprint. That's, that's, uh, that's news to me. So uh, where these discussions are facilitating development within the, within the companies. And, um, you yeah, know, I think that's where it starts. Really. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And... Um... You mentioned as well going climate positive. I don't know if you can explain what what that phrase means. Well, I think it's very much about considering how we can transform the overall economy and the overall process of what we're doing, which is very much linear, take raw materials, use them and throw them away, mm -hmm. uh, which... Um, which uh, benefits a small few um, on the on the economic scale, but not the not the majority, and certainly has uh, a lot of collateral damage in terms of communities and the environment, to a more circular model, uh, and therefore, whereby, at minimum, where uh, the ideal is that where um, there's no impact, mm -hmm. but really the world really isn't in a very good place right now, and therefore just doing the right thing is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to do more of the right thing so that by our very presence, we leave the world and the, you know, our area of, of our sphere of influence a better place. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at a carbon footprint, we're not just compensating for our footprint, we're overcompensating, if you like. Yeah. Um, where by our presence, we will have sequestered more carbon than we emitted mm -hmm. um, by our presence we will have reduced our waste um, landfill plastic footprint um, and left a legacy and and influenced peers to so that there is less waste in the world because of our presence not not more